welcome back everyone thanks for joining the podcast of the north south dialogue project i am rituparna your host this pod- podcast is produced by the collaborative work of the international policy institute of the university of washington and doing sociology blog in india today we have with us amrita das gupta and sampurna das amrita and sampurna welcome to this podcast can i ask both of you to briefly introduce yourself maybe let's go alphabetically with amrita first um first of all thank you sampurna uh, for uh, thank you <laughs> doing such sociology for having me here and uh, I am Amrita Das Gupta. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the Department of Gender Studies, School of Oriental and African Studies. And I work on the Deltaic women of Bengal and their livelihoods. I specifically focus on the community of tiger widows and sex workers in the lower Deltaic region of Bengal. Thank you, Amrita. Sampurna, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for giving us this platform. So yeah, so I'm a doctoral candidate currently in my fourth year of my PhD uh, at the Department of Sociology, Delhi School of Economics. Uh, so uh, so broadly, my I look into the fields of uh, environmental and developmental sociology. So and within that, my primary focus is to understand the lives and livelihoods in the floodplains, uh, in the floodplain regions of the Brahmaputra uh, River in uh, Assam. So, yeah. Right. Uh, very interesting. And I'm super excited to hear more of your research. So if we can begin with you, Amrita, what is your research field and uh, how would you locate the inspiration behind choosing this as your PhD topic? Yeah, thank you for the question. And um, to be very honest, uh, uh, I started working without knowing what I would like to work on. And uh, to be specific that my research field is the lower Delta I Bengal, precisely the Sundarbans. I started working during my MPhil on this area, which was three years ago from now. And I worked with the community of tiger widows back then, trying to problematize uh, certain questions that I always have had, that is relating to how climate change or the environment has always affected the life and livelihood of women, Deltaic women in Sundarbans. And doing so, I came across uh, several uh, other junctures, such as the human animal conflict in the area, even staying in the villages where I conducted my MPhil field work, such as uh, Dulki and Bali too, in Sundarbans, India. I was staying at a close proximity of the border, India-Bangladesh border, and I realized that the border also problematizes the situation of these women who are being trafficked across uh, India to Bangladesh and vice versa from Bangladesh to India for the purpose of sex work. And that these women might be categorized as climate exiles or climate refugees as well. Because from this area, these women, the inhabitants of Sundarbans on both sides of Bangla- on both sides of the border that is in Bangladesh and India, they were forced to take up uh, sex work or they were, even if they were not coerced, if they took it up out of will, they were doing this because they had lost everything to the climatic disasters in the area. And it is so poverty stricken that they would do anything that would give them money. And being mostly unlettered or having no uh, skills or training, uh, sex work was the easiest method for them. And to be uh, honest about what inspired me, My inspiration had been my family history. Uh, I come from a family of partition survivors who had actually used uh, the waterways uh, during the partition to come to uh, India from now Bangladesh, which was then declared as East Pakistan. And they had used the waterways, the shared waterways between India and Bangladesh that runs through Shundarbun to come here. And uh, that is when I realized that Uh, how important this delta has been and how uh, unnatural it has been to fracture uh, a very mobile delta, very active delta, because it is a very environmentally fragile zone. 
and the rivers there continuously keep on shifting places. Uh, and that brought me to another very important understanding that these shifting waterways were also mobile borders or mobile uh, spaces of escape uh, that, were, that act as pockets of escape when you uh, look through the militarization or surveillance that is done on the, on the aspects of land border. So uh, I realized that there are other categories as well that I would like to problematize because, um, and also question, uh, when my family came, a portion of them were called refugees, Udbastu, Shorbohara. There were several, several definitions, several terminologies, and they meant either the same thing to some people or different things to other. So when I look at this category of women or these women who are tiger widows, they are also sex workers at some times. Uh, some of them are also climate exiles or climate refugees. Some of them, when they cross the border, they are also uh, an illegal migrant. It is something, you know, their definition or their identity of themselves is always in conflict with the state, conflict with the bureaucratic papers. And that is what uh, made me realize that you really need to question how we define these category of women or how we have, or my family has some, you know, sometimes back defined themselves, where the refugees, uh, where the Shorbohara, where they're just migrants, um, who they were. So yeah, this is the portion of my story. Right, uh, very interesting, Amrita. Sampuna, if I may ask you the same question, uh, could you describe a little bit about your research field and the inspiration behind it? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so uh, geographically, uh, like my field is in the western part of Assam, and so I am looking currently in the floodplains of Assam, so which are locally known as the Chor, by Chor, you would mean the Sandbar area, so these uh, floodplains are, I am not exactly looking at the floodplains that are connected to the banks, but rather the floodplains or the sandbars which are located in between a river so uh, like it, it will be like an island a river island so i'm trying to understand lives and livelihoods uh, in the islands and also uh because these are like very uncertain sort of landscapes which because it keeps on eroding and accreting every year due to the floods so they keep on constantly uh, moving so what happens is like firstly uh, the, uh, the the land uh, the land legal land uh, the legal uh, lexicon the land lexicons for example the revenue terminologies for them are not are not the same as like for example we on the inland would have so that keeps on uh, shifting and changing so i'm trying to understand and like how do people negotiate between like a sort of like a very different or rather also uh, uh, like uh, one can even say that it's it's a non-existing sort of like a land uh, uh, land right land uh, claims that is uh, that are that you can see in this floodplain so i'm trying to understand how are the locals who are living there are trying to like uh, negotiate with these uh, sort of uncertainties with land then again also with this very 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 scientific idea of example if you say floodplains floods and uh, and all like sort of like this uh, and the idea of floodplains it's usually it's like the idea of inundation that comes to my mind but then i am also trying to problematize how how the locals would not just see the floods to be just equal equal to inundation but that, that's there's a lot more that's happening naturally there, there's a lot of uh, natural uh uh, processes that are happening along with the flood plains and they club everything together to mean flood flood uh, flood floods so uh, as and that we all we can there, therefore also see that there's a certain sort of sort of knowledge production that is happening which is very different to a very very scientific uh, hydro sociological or social hydro hydrological understanding of flood so that's another thing that i'm trying to look at and also coming to the lives and livelihoods uh, because like when we see like uh, we imagine these sort of uh, landscapes to be like a very homogeneous identity because as we know and like uh, and my field also uh, relates with this uh, current ongoing uh, uh, citizenship discourses so basically like the the, the entire population most population uh, the majority of population 
in this flood plains have like a a bengal origin like that the like a east bengal origin uh, population lives in this flood, flood plain so i'm trying to also understand for example how are they also uh, trying to like relate or not relate to the this sort of like uh, their uh, their origin stories how they are trying to like locate that origin story to the current uh, to the current uh, citizenship discourses and and in that sense i am also trying to understand the citizenship aspect as well so there are multiple things that i am seeing uh, as i am writing i'm start, starting to write my field work so these are like the, the flood the citizenship the land discourses so like uh, like it's like a gamut of all this thing that is helping me understand the life the ecology in the flood plain regions of assam so and coming to your question about like what influenced me is like like uh, so yeah that the the academic training is one that's one thing like like the academic training with environmental sociology development discourses and all that was on one side but also my own personal interactions with the community for example uh, mostly in the in the in the uh, in the in the uh, different markets in the city of uh, guwahati from where from where i am from you you can uh, actually see like uh, the most of the uh, uh, like the traders or like the farmers who are coming to sell in the city of guwahati come from these sort of like the chor areas their neighboring chor areas of uh, of of the city and so so i was like quite like because like as a child i used to go along with my parent and like like because like when my parents would would be buying i would like just talk or try to listen to them uh, listen from where they come because they keep on saying like for example if you go towards like the end end of like towards the Uh, like the end of the market time for example like in the evening ish they would keep on saying like like we have to catch the boat we have to go back to our uh, chor so it was very fascinating for me like where are these people coming from what are these islands like what 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 is it like because we don't we don't really talk much about it so it's oh, this the, the 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 sense that there is there are some islands that there are some uh, uh, some uh, there are some flood plains or people stay in the flood plains which are also on the one hand it's like it keeps on changing it was very fascinating for me so in that sense i started to pursue that that idea that maybe one day i would go and see these flood plains when so eventually with my training and like in the course of like my uh, like uh, as i have uh, as i started to propose my topic so that became like i actually went into the field altogether so so i just didn't go to stay there and just see that but that um, became my entire research as well so yeah that's about my story right right so uh, both of you talk about being an insider or being an outsider semi insider into the fields there was some familiarity with it in sampuna's case but for amrita it's uh, more personal so in that context i would actually want to know uh, about your research methods and you know what kind of research ideas settings assumptions that you took to the field as well as the methods that you have been using uh, while conducting field work yeah so uh, as you have mentioned that it has been very personal for me i should mention a very little story here when we used to be young uh, in calcutta it was everyone around me mostly spoke about the royal bengal tiger and how during winters you take a trip to the sundarbans to see the wildlife there so my father used to take me to sundarbans and uh, i never spotted a tiger but what i did see was everybody going there would go with one single aim or want that is to see the tiger so if they got to see a crocodile or a snake or a deer like if there is a deer park and they are kept there and you get to see them in a netted area they would be very disappointed what people never saw or pushed into their unconscious was that people who inhabited the forest or who were living in continuous struggle with the environment around them and the history that actually landed them here so there was this deliberate bhadralok or the Cal calcutta elite uh, intention
I think about wild, wildlife, but what I saw uh, when I started. Yeah. So uh, I had that in the back of my head and I took it into my MPhil as well as my PhD. And now I'm doing my PhD field work. And when I did my MPhil field work, I realized uh, that there are a lot of methodologies which I am not well trained in, but which would actually help me feel the lacuna of, of the research that I was chasing. So I come from a literature background primarily, then I moved into uh, gender studies. And now my methodology is specifically dependent on history and ethnography. It's a mixture of history and ethnography. So I start with realizing how literature can be a part of archive. So I read through the text and I realize that somebody, uh, a very, very important person doing work in Shundarbon named uh, Tony Stewart, Professor Tony St uh, Stewart, had actually uh, <laughs> written this answer, has given this answer that, you know, uh, he cites uh, Shukumar Sen and says that uh, we really need to drop the distinction, the artificial distinction existing between history and fiction. And uh, reading his work, I realized that he has used the Peer Kothas of the region uh, to say about uh, how Islam had assumed its form in Bengal. And when I read the Bon Bibi Juhuranama, I realized that Bone Bibi talks about uh, the land, how she is dividing the land between the humans and the animals in, the, in that mythological text. And somewhere I realized that it has an historical significance regarding the extension of uh, Bengal's uh, agri agricultural border or agricultural frontier. And somehow she really misses out, uh, Bone Baby misses out on talking about how the resources of water should be divided. And that is when I realized that uh, this is what led the people of the region to maybe accept a Hindu pantheon goddess like Gonga to come and rescue them when they actually cannot uh, understand why the water, the element water would go against them in case, in, in certain cases of high tide uh, and climatic catastrophes in the region. The second that I really look forward to is, and I'm also learning, is decolonizing the colonial archives. Uh, I realized that archives, and it has been very well written and theorized, that archives are, uh, are a reflection of what the, colon, you know, the British saw to be true. So when I looked through the maps, I saw that one of Reynolds' map from Shundarbon told that the area was depopulated because of Mark invasions. And when I started looking into the other documents uh, in the archive, I realized during the same period, there had been repeated uh, storms, cyclones, and climatic catastrophe in the area, which must have also added to the depopulation in the area. So there was not only a single reason, there must, there, there were many. And to, you know, uh, support what the archives have to say from the past, we really need a voice from the presence, present. So that is where ethnography comes in. And here I take support of participatory research where uh, I work in close collaboration with the community interviewing them, spending time with them, trying to know what they have to comment about uh, the present situation and their livelihood patterns. And I do this keeping in mind uh, my training in gender studies and my ideology of uh, forming uh, a female-centric or gynocentric knowledge about things. And that leads me to a very technical aspect theoretical aspect rather of building feminist epistemology. So somewhere I believe that these archives which have recorded history have been very androcentric. They have been androcentric. There hasn't been representation of women knowledge and women voice. So there needs to be an inclusion of perspective and not only female perspective, 
perspective from the ground, which is a bottom up methodology. And it's not a methodology that trickles down from the above. So I am still trying to figure out if there would be other methods. And I am working on a, on a, on a fact that how fiction uh, talks to history and how fiction also talks about the contemporary situation. It is for me to still unpack uh, why a region that believes in a female deity and works according to her dictates, fears her psychologically, would not put women in the center of their community. For example, I went in for field work and in the year 2017 and 18, I asked a group of tiger widows to pose for me in front of a boat. I asked them to get on the boat. They would not. They told me that the tiger widower could do that. We are considered as ill omen and we will stand on the ground, take our picture like this. We don't want to curse the boat of occupation. These, even my methodologies is complicating uh, my idea, my, my idea of the field and my argument of the research. And I believe that somewhere my methods will actually help me to form a complete idea of how to feel, fill this, these gaps that are persistent and prevalent in my research arena. Right, uh, Sampuna, if I ask you the same question about you know, some of the research methods that you have been using or rather dealing with in the field. Yeah, so uh, like I had recently completed my, uh, my uh, field work. So my field work is like the nature of the field work is ethnographic. So I had stayed there for like uh, 18 months on the field. So, so and uh, like I had been using a different uh, methods within it, like the participant observation. I, I had performed many focus group uh, discussions around that and also some un like uh, very many unstructured uh, interviews, also structured interviews. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and also because a part of my work also deals with uh, the understanding of legal issues, uh, legality. So I had also spent uh, like a substantial amount of time in the archives, looking around for the archives, reading the archives. So that's, uh, that's one thing. So, but then like, just like Amrita said, like, uh, like uh, while doing ethnography uh, is like, it's very endocentric. So yeah, that's, that's there. Uh, so one has to devise so many sort of life, uh, like, uh, like turning around doing how things are ought to be done but then you tend to do it completely differently on uh, in, in the in the field for example during participant observation for example you are so you are you are you are, you are you are actually trained to just observe and be there but then like how do you do that like in a in a situation where for example all of your interlocutors are male and then they are doing a thing which is very masculine and if you are going to take it up then and take it up just so that you can get like a better hang of what is happening in the field they are completely going to deceive you or they they won't like talk to you anymore so the repo gets challenged so all these things was something that i faced in the in the in the in the during the field work and i think so we can talk about it in the next section but then uh yeah uh, that's what i would want to say like how i went about in the in the ethnography like while doing the ethnography yeah right right so uh maybe this time we begin with sampurna since you uh, sort of led on to it uh also talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you have faced in the field. Uh, being an Assamese myself, I know that Chor areas present their own set of challenges, which would be very unique, particularly to women ethnographers. So if you could talk a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, so first thing was like, it took me a lot of time to finally to finalize the place I would live in. For example, uh, the pilot study, my pilot study was very like, just extended to like, uh, like, 
two or three months for for so it was like really long sort of a pilot study because I was not able to fix where I would actually anchor my research the first thing was because of my social position the the religion and all sort of a caste identity that's one thing and the other thing was like uh, uh other thing was like I was a female so like it's it, it was from the either side for example my family was slightly hesitant uh for me going and staying there on the other hand even my interlocutors they were also not very welcoming of of letting me in into the into the uh into the into the homes for example they would say if, uh, like 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 uh, like what happened what, what if something happens what if some some boy or the other in 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 our community says something uh, in, inappropriate to you and then and, and then you uh just put it out there and then go out there and that just 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 escalates and something or the other happens to a community because like uh as you must be knowing like the community the the, pe the people living in the chores the the, Bing the bengal origin muslims all like as we as we as it is commonly known as the mias they are already always uh, like harassed so like they just don't want any more reason like coming from me me to be like harassed so that's one thing so it took me a lot of time just uh, moving around in the field so but then specifically what i would say is like what was very challenging for me was like because these stores are like they are like uh, they are uh, like uh, infrastructurally they are very on the weaker side so they would not have much of the sanitation facilities and uh, all or of or any any of that sort so like when we go into the field we are almost like for example if we go back to our readings about ethnography the melinoskian or idea of ethnography so nobody talks about all these things they just land up and they start uh, start staying there and this just, just get on starting data but then the, the what i face are like very practical issues of like sanitation of uh, of hygiene of, uh, of of not even having a bathroom for that matter so so when i first went to the went into the field and just finalized and uh, finalized so i it was it was like i had to walk almost like two kilometers to the nearest school to be able to uh, reach to the nearest bathroom so where i would take my bath and like uh, do other uh, other stuff so, that's one thing so initially i was juggling so i used to walk every day every morning like uh, uh and to like two kilometers from the place i used to stay and then take a bath and then come back and like for all the other like uh all the other things in in the in the day it followed so every time i had to walk so long take carry all my uh, uh, toiletries and everything and just go there so that was one thing but then also like eventually what happened was that that was just a bathroom bathroom so where you can take bath and at the max you can uh just like i'm just being very uh like upfront here but you can just uh like uh, you, you you can maybe uh like just speak so that's one thing so you are so for then again to like for again for some something else you have to go somewhere else again that, that's one thing so especially during menstruation it was like a huge huge problem for me because one have because i have to carry like a bucket of water every time so, so like two kilometers so it was not very easy so yeah someday or the other someone would come to help me but then it was not always and i didn't really feel feel it feel like it was very like i did not feel like always asking someone for to carry like a bucket of water for me so that is one thing so during like during my menstrual cycle for example i tried staying there for my like the first menstrual cycle during my field work but then or because all of these issues i then decided that no no this is not happening so i am i cannot stay so because it's too much of work it's too much of uh, like pushing myself like physically to stay there in the field so and then but then uh, also like when i like i was like a split between two things like like one thing was like like the physical thing of like me not being able to do the field uh, like not like me pushing the limits of my uh, limits and then the other thing was this a sense of guilt the guilt that like maybe like like when i like i'm out of the field because of this menstruation uh, because of my cycle so like for example i would be out for like a week so from the from the from the uh, geographical field side and then um and to 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 be uh to be staying outside the field so i was like constantly feeling guilty like like am i missing out on data like this is not the right way of the, doing ethnography because that was because that is something i we had never like we never discussed in our in our in our classes classrooms like like this is not ethnography this is not how, how ethnography should be done i should not be taking like this weekly uh weekly uh, gaps every month so that that's going to hamper the sort of the 
the nature of data that uh, I would be collecting. So, so initially I was talking around with my friends. So they were like, no, it's okay. Uh, like you can actually uh, take, you can actually come back. That's not an issue. You should not be pushing yourself too much. But then, then I was also guilty. So like it was only like towards the third month of my field work that I finally decided no, that like I am not going to guilt myself so much. So let's talk with the supervisor. So I talked to my supervisor. She was like really, really warm. And then she said, no, no, it's, it's absolutely okay to uh, like take uh, like um, uh, take breaks, like to like, and that self-care is also very, very important while you are doing an ethnography. And like one has to step out of these very Malinoskian idea of doing ethnography of what it should be like to be an ethnographer. And that the ethnographer's body is not just like a male body, a non-menstruating body. So you have to consider all of these things and then put it, uh, together and only then the ethnography would be reflexive enough it's not about just understanding the people it's also about understanding yourself as an ethnographer that you can actually produce like a good set of knowledge so yeah I went uh, went on so I completed like my like this uh, 18 months of field work doing so but then even now I have this sense of guilt like somewhere somewhere it's there that like did I miss on to some data? Because some days it's, it was like, like when I am out of the field set, someone from my uh, field would call me that this has happened. So I would feel guilt at that sense. So I'm just still struggling with that. Like even when I'm starting to write, so that sort of thing is also coming. So, and I, I would <laughs> actually blame like the sort of training we had while doing ethnography. So basically that's about it. Yeah, thank you. Right. I think you have put it out very well for women researchers, and I'm sure our listeners would benefit from uh, listening to what kind of challenges you have faced and kind of relating it to the work that they have been doing as well. Amrita, uh, so uh, that's my question to you as well. Could you talk about some of the challenges that you have faced in the field? Yes, as Sampuna says, the challenges are many fold. And I would like to, for, for the purpose of making it easy, uh, talk about archives and again talk about ethnography. So I'll start with the archive. So when I go to the archive, uh, the first thing I see is invisibilized people. There is less to no documentation on uh, sex work. So there is a sense that they would not want to recognize uh, this portion of the society. Even when I go to, when I chase the government officials or the local people and the NGOs about uh, the count of tiger widows, apparent, you know, uh, average count of tiger widows in a village in Shundarbon, they do not have any. They do not want to keep any. Uh, you can go to the police and ask them for for the records and they would say, we have you know, two, two people recorded here who have died out of a tiger attack because most people will not come and complain to us as they go into the forest without a legal permit. And so they, are, they actually go unreported and there is an absolute blank about the apparent official numbers of what is happening. That also informs my methodology about invisibilizing these people in history as well as in contemporary records. Uh, I would also like to talk about the ethnography, which is a very important aspect, uh, as Sampurna has mentioned, uh, because I work with a very sensitive uh, community. I have to approach them by means of NGOs. And most of the time I have seen that the NGOs teach the community what they are supposed to say. And in my case, Sundarbans is, uh, the community in Sundarban is very well versed about what to say because they have faced so many researchers, at least in the Indian side. And they would continuously question me that we have already given our interviews, done this, and there have been so many researchers who have approached us. Our conditions have never changed. What different will you do for us? So there is the sense in me uh, where I have had to learn how to communicate 
I am not a policy builder, but my research could inform policy builders. And that is how far I as a researcher can help so that they have, they give me informed consent because whatever I say them, this is the question I always face, that they have seen a lot of researchers come here, but that has actually not changed their life in any way. And some are always very angry. They are like, you get so much out of us by publicizing our life, writing about our lives, but our lives don't change. And somewhere that has mostly pushed me to uh, give away my researcher's stance of uh, not being you know, emotionally involved with my uh, interviewees or the community I'm working with. And I realized that that is something I have to uh, work on and rebuild myself. Uh, and there is the sense of abandonment. When I, as a, as a Calcutta bred woman go into uh, Shundarbon to take interviews or do ethnography, the first thing they categorize me as is either a, urban tourist who will anyway come here, uh, go around, do touristy things and will go away. Or one among the other researchers who have come will get our information and go away. So it is very difficult to, you know, overcome this obstacle and get them to talk to you. It takes a lot of time and patience. So the field has taught me a lot of patience. I realized that if I start behaving as somebody different from them, which I am, which I actually am, my privileged position does not allow me to be completely one with them. But I can try, like Sampuna told that there has been problems in the field. I also work in a remote field. And I realized that field actually taught me to shed my privilege and which the classroom never did. And uh, I realize that I have to sit with them. I have to work with them. I have to go to the fields with them. And if necessary, I have to go to the forest with them. So they trust me. And they, and they at least realize that I am ready to give away my privilege and understand and acknowledge the inequality that prevails. Uh, because if I don't acknowledge it and I actually don't comprehend it, then I will never be able to talk to them. And uh, it also, I also faced a real big blockage uh, thinking about uh, why would <laughs> I continuously keep on talking to them about data? Because in Shundarbon, India, most people are very well versed about the research terminologies, given that so many researchers have been there continuously, and it's a hotspot. And sometimes I was like, it is a very scientific terminology and makes me feel very inhuman, but it is a research terminology that I have to use. Uh, and then I started uh, you know, apologizing because I started feeling bad, but in lack of a better terminology, uh, I had to do it. And I'm still trying to, you know, again, working on terminologies about fieldwork and working on terminologies about how these people, these communities define themselves. Yeah, and the last thing I would like to mention is, uh, I realize climate is not new. Suddenly people, are, people talk about climate and uh, uh, they say that it's an issue and Shundarbon and other hotspots are facing it. It was always there, we somehow did not look into it and somewhere international relations actually bring it into the fore. Yeah, so these are the, some of the challenges I have faced. And yeah, regarding climate, I just cannot talk this enough to people that it's not a new issue. It has been happening. But if we don't pay much attention now, it will be too late. Right, right. Uh, thank you so much. But since this is also a, a dialogue podcast, I wanted to ask if either Amrita or Sampuna has a question for each other.
Yeah, uh, I would like, because I'm very fascinated by what Sampurna is doing. And uh, she also talks about the chore. And uh, I realized that there is also a, she's actually talking about a very mobile landscape because chore, as uh, I'm asking Sampurna this, the chores come and they might go anytime away. So how does, uh, have, have, have uh, Sampurna ever, uh, faced this in the field that the cho the people of the chore, I believe they're called choruas, uh, do they have a problem in defining themselves? Like I am working on how my community would like to define themselves. Are they climate exiles, sex workers, only tiger widows, illegal migrants? So are the inhabitants of chore facing a difficulty in uh, identifying themselves. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Amrita. So yeah, absolutely. They are actually struggling with the identities because it's not only that the geography that is giving them the identity, this entire discourse around citizenship, then their uh, particular history, their migratory history. So it, it makes it really makes it really difficult for them to identify um, themselves so for example like uh, like there, there is this idea of reclaiming the their identity so so widely um, uh, like a, a section of people within them uh, would try to term them uh, themselves to be mias like reclaiming this entire identity of mia because like uh, like until now or like even now mia is termed to be like a derogatory word towards these uh, bengal origin muslims who who say may, mainly in the church, but also in the Indian area. So that's one thing. So, so for example, if I try to like just put in like whether are you try do you relate with uh, the identity of Mia? Then somebody would say yes, we do. But somebody prefer would not prefer themselves to be termed as Mia. They would not term them to be Mia, Mias. And then on the other hand, they would also like for example this 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 term that Chol was. I did not come across them. They using it in a sense like at least in my field in the western Islam area Cholua. so that's like i like uh like i have come up with i, I know this word based on my literature of uh, Cholwas in bangladesh and, and maybe in west bengal but in assam they do not specifically use this word as Cholwas for themselves so that's one thing so um, they would they, it's very it's very uh difficult of how they they term themselves sometimes they would just very very flatly term themselves to be muslims sometimes they would term themselves to be bengali muslims on the other hand so that it, it keeps on changing so so there is a tension of how they are also identifying themselves so yeah that that's there and it, it just it, it's there all over my field notes it's just there it's 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 a, it's, it's it's a problem right. so yeah uh, so, Sampurna, so do you also have a question for Amrita? Yeah, I, I also have a question for Amrita. So, for example, so uh, so when you say like uh, like in your field, uh, like like so many, it's like a hotspot, like it's like a, a hotspot for researchers, and so like so many of them have actually done the research research. So also, I've read like a few of them, a few few researchers in Sundarbans. So like how like uh, like do they like I'm just putting it on point on blank like, do they ask for money or like do they do they want like i will give you data on the exchange of money because also you're located like not in uh, not in india but you're located somewhere like in london so, for example they also have this idea that ob obviously the person would have so much so uh, so such kind of uh, like funds with them so that we can trade off our data with the money sort of a thing so, so have you ever come across this aspect and if you have come across this aspect of like giving money for data which is like unethical as per the as per our classroom discussions but like did you did you negotiate some uh, like or i had like i i or, or do you feel that you will come up well uh, you have to face this sort of a situation any day yeah uh, thank you sampuna for that question that is a very important question for the field work i can't thank you enough for giving me this opportunity to talk about this yes i have faced this so when i was working during 2016 to 2018 in sundarbon i was an mphil scholar and i did not have funds enough so when i went in as my ethics did not allow me to pay they i have faced this question what will we get do we get money? Right. And 
I had I was direct that I don't have any. And to be very honest, uh, given the ethics, because there are no ethics form and an ethical mm-hmm. committee for an MPhil at least in India, in Indian universities, I was not well taught. And somehow, you know, the NGO handled it and I did not have to pay the money. And they came, they gave their interview, they showed me and I stayed there. I did my ethnography. I would talk to some people when I walked down the road. And in India, there is no, I this uh, during MPhil, we did not have anything called a consent form. Hmm. So it was not being so difficult. I could be very direct. So when I do my field work now, I work on the sex workers community. Hmm. There is a proper ethical commu- you know, ethical committee in my university. We have to have consent forms. We have to have, you know, our field work approved from the ethical community uh, and the ethical committee at the university. So this time I have funds and uh, am I, I'm better taught. And <laughs> I can say that because I'm working with the sex workers this time, I want to remunerate them for the time they give me because they are keeping aside their occupation, their time for work and giving me that time. So I proposed it to uh, my ethical uh, committee at university that uh, when I speak to the sex workers and many have done this, many have done this and even my seniors have done this when they have worked with certain communities like I'm speaking about especially London. Uh, And I learned from them that if you are, if somebody has to leave their occupation and give you time, you pay them for that time. That's a sign of respect. And that is what they deserve. Uh, So yeah, this time uh, I will be, you know, I have spoken to the ethical community, ethical committee at the university. And because they will be leaving their job and uh, during that time, giving me their valuable time interview. So yes, uh, this time I will be uh, paying them for their time. And, uh, but when I did my MPhil, I was young and I did not know enough about ethics. There was no course, no committee, nothing, no uh, constant forms, but still I had to stand in front of the NGO and say, I am for, I'm here for this, I do this, this is my identity card. So I would need your interviews. This time I have everything proper a consent form, everything. So even before I publish my MPhil, I'm going back to the field, uh, taking a proper consent, re-interviewing the same people if they're alive and if they have not migrated and I'm able to look at them and doing them properly the way they are supposed to be done. I don't know, like Sampurna uh, is, I don't know, I'm talking about MPhil. I have no idea about PhD. And I was doing gender studies, not even anthropology. So I don't know if the anthropology- Do you have consent forms during the MPhil? No, no, not <laughs> yet. Not even during our PhD. So that is like a huge thing. Like it's a, it's a problem. Like no, oh, yeah. my peers have also faced. Like how do how do you deal with this request? Because like it's a genuine request. But then also the kind of training we have, like the high handedness of this data, this knowledge, pure knowledge, pure data, and all that things. It really like it messes up with our this uh, like this practical need of which is fine. Like it, we don't mind giving them like a money, not in exchange of data per se, but then as a means of helping them. But then on the other hand, with the sort of training we go through, it, it's really difficult. Like, like uh, it, it's like messy. Yeah, it, it is messy. This is the same thing I felt uh, during my MPhil. But when I did my coursework for PhD, I realized reading through materials and speaking to my seniors who have done their field work that you are paying for their time because they leave their occupation. Uh, and most of these people are daily wage earners. So they leave that and come and give you a day's time or right. maybe three yeah. hours from their day's time. So you pay for that time because otherwise they would be working. It is like loss of work. So, so you are not buying data. You are just paying for that kind of loss because I was also you know, trying to negotiate if I am buying data. True, true. Yeah, so, and we don't really talk much about that. So it's like a hush topic. Nobody talks about monetary transactions in the field. So, so that's yeah. the 
I I'm very glad, Sampurna, you asked this question and we had a chance to discuss it because ethics, of course, have become much more important in anthropology in recent years. And we have seen certain cases as well. I'm sure that we still have a lot to accomplish. And thank you so much to both of you for the enriching conversation. It was a pleasure talking to both of you. And to our viewers and listeners, thanks for listening to this podcast of the North-South Dialogue Project. If you want to be featured in this podcast, please send an email to nsdialogue at uw.edu with a brief introduction of yourself and the research. Thank you, everyone. See you in the next podcast.